Hello, welcome back to Math 155. Today we're going to be talking about linear systems of differential equations. In particular, we'll be talking about the different types of behaviors that we get and how we can analyze these things graphically. Okay, so in general, we can uh, write down a system of linear differential equations in the form of dx dt is equal to a matrix A, which describes the interactions between all of the different components in this vector x, plus some forcing term g. Okay, so just to clarify, in our vector x, each of these different x1s, x2s at time t describe a different, uh, say, class in our population, for example, juveniles or adults. The matrix A tells you how um, those different classes interact, and the vector G tells you about some forcing component. Don't need to worry about that forcing component um, for today. We are, are going to focus on the case where there's no forcing. And to keep things nice and simple, we're just going to focus on the simplest case where we just have two different components, an x1 and an x2. So we can write these things down because they're linear in this form here. dx1 dt is equal to some coefficient a times by x1 plus some coefficient b times by x2. And similarly for our dx2 dt. And then because this is uh, a linear system, we can write this in vector and matrix form dx dt is equal to a times by x, where our matrix a is just going to be the, the matrix of these uh, coefficients, so a, b, c, and d in this case. So as an example of this, imagine you want to model cancer treatment where you're injecting radioactive molecules into the bloodstream, and then you want to track um, how those molecules attach to the tumor cells to kill them and the amount of um, antibody uh, molecules that are in the bloodstream as well. Okay, so if we use x1 to x1 of t and x2 of t is the amount of antibody in the bloodstream and in the tumor, respectively, then we can write down the rate at which um, the amount of antibody in, in the bloodstream and in the tumor changes as dx1 dt and dx2 dt. And then if we say that a is the clearance rate from the blood, then we're going to have a minus a times by the amount that's in the blood, x1. If b is the rate of movement from blood into the tumor, then we're going to have a minus bx1 in this first equation here, so that's antibody leaving the blood, and a plus bx1 in the second equation, so it's going into the tumor. And then if c is the clearance rate from the tumor, we're going to have a minus c times by x2. So you can write this down as a matrix model, so you could write this down as dx dt is equal to a x, where our matrix a is just going to be minus a minus b, 0, b, and minus c times by x1, x2. Now, in general, for uh, a system like this, a linear system, we say that an equilibrium of this system is a pair x star equal to x1 star, x2 star, such that ax star is equal to zero. Now, for a linear system, typically, we're going to have x star is equal to zero. This isn't true necessarily for nonlinear systems, but for a linear system, this is always going to be true. So this is the equilibrium that we'd be focusing on. Here, dx dt is going to equal ax star, which is just going to equal zero. Okay, we say that um, an equilibrium x star is going to be locally stable if the limit, as we tend towards, as t tends towards infinity of our solution x of t is equal to the state vector x star. So that's for some x naught initial vector for our population sufficiently close to this equilibrium. Okay, we say that this is linearly stable um, or locally stable. Okay. We can also have cases where things are globally stable, um, but we're not going to talk about those. As I mentioned, for these linear systems, finding the equilibrium is very easy. Um, that's because if we have no forcing, um, we're only going to have this x star being equal to zero as our only equilibrium for the system. And to understand that stability, we need to look at the eigenvalues, and we're not going to be talking about that today. We're going to be talking about um, some graphical analysis today. Okay, so let's just recall what we have if we want to work out the stability of a system um, where we just have one differential equation. So for example, in the model dx dt is equal to r of x, we know that we just have one fixed point when x is equal to zero. So this is a linear 
one dimensional um, ODE. And we know that the population grows if R is greater than zero. So X equals zero is unstable in this case. The population decays if R is less than zero, in which case X equals zero is stable. And if R is equal to zero, then nothing happens. The population either grows or decays. So that's very simple in one dimension. When we're in two dimensions, we have um, uh, much more complicated dynamics now. Uh, I'll break these down into three different groups. We have things called saddle points. We can have nodes that may be stable or unstable. And then we can have things that uh, oscillate. So they could be stable or unstable stable spirals, or they could be centers. So I'll talk about these different types of dynamics graphically. So last time out, we met uh, phase line diagrams in one dimension. And the two dimensional analog of that is a phase plane diagram. So we've gone from a line to a plane now. And essentially, we have all of these different um, arrows on here, which describe if you are at, say, a point here, x naught, this arrow here describes how the population is changing at that time. OK, so if you think that ax naught is also a vector, this vector here is that ax naught. OK, so we can draw any trajectory we like. Say we're starting over here, where this green dot is. We can draw, draw any trajectory like we like just by following all of those arrows. OK, likewise, if I was to pick a point, say, down here, I can follow trajectories by following those arrows. If I was to choose one over here, I would go off in this direction like that. So how can we understand what's going on? Well, if you notice, there are these two lines that are drawn on with dx dt, dx2 dt is equal to zero and dx1 dt is equal to zero. So those are these lines here and here. And these are known as null lines. And these are really important for phase plane diagrams because we have null clines when either dx1 dt is equal to zero or dx2 dt is equal to zero. So what these null clines tell us is that our uh, state vector x, although it's composed of an x1 and an x2, as we are crossing a null cline, only one of those state variables is changing. Okay, so that means that, for example, in this uh, case up here with the dx2 dt equal to zero, we know that as we're crossing this sloped line here, that we need to be going horizontally. That's because there's no change in the vertical direction. There's no change in x2 because dx2 dt is equal to zero. Likewise, this horizontal line here, we know that dx1 dt is equal to zero. So that means that there's only a change in the vertical direction. So we're not changing x1 at all. There could be a change in x2. So if we think about what's going on um, in this particular case, if we know that these arrows here are up here, they're going to the right. Up here, they're going down here, they're going to the left. Um, on this left-hand side, they're going down. And on this right-hand side, they're going up. So just by drawing on our null clines and thinking what's happening on those null clines, we can immediately tell what's going on by say, saying, okay, well, we can, we know that trajectories in this region are gonna go here. We know that trajectories in this region are gonna go here. Likewise, we see trajectories going there. So this phase plane diagram here is actually an example of something called a saddle. Um, and the reason this is a saddle is because essentially we have motion moving towards the origin in one direction and away from it in the other. So we see that as we um, come in on a trajectory like this, we move towards the origin, but then we eventually move away from the origin. Likewise, if we come in from over here, we move towards the origin and then away from the origin. So this um, is an example of a saddle. You can think of it as taking the shape a bit like a horse's saddle. That's why it's called a saddle. So if we go through this in a bit more detail with an example, suppose we have dx dt is equal to uh, 0, 1, 2, minus 1. So this is our matrix A, that's by x. If you want to calculate our null clines, well, we want dx d1 dt to be equal to 0. 
we multiply out the first line of this um, equation up here, so multiply this by x1 and x2, we're going to have 0 times by x1 plus 1 times by x2. So it's just going to be x2. And this has got to be equal to 0. Okay, So that means that on the line x2 is equal to 0, we know that dx1 dt is equal to 0. So that means we neither need to be going up or we need to be going down. We do the same for x2. We multiply out the second row now. We're going to have 2 times by x1 plus minus 1. So I'll change this to a minus. Minus 1 times by x2. And this must be equal to 0. So that tells us that x1 has got to equal x2 over 2. So on this line, x1 is equal to x2 over 2. We need our uh, arrows to be either pointing left or right. And that's because there's no change in x2, but there is a change in x1. Okay, so if we wanted to draw this out, let's just first on write on our x1 and our x2. Let's plot our null clines. First of all, we had a null cline dx1 dt is equal to zero on the line x2 is equal to zero. So let's draw this null cline here. And then we're going to have a second null cline when x1 is equal to x2 over 2. So that's going to look something like this. So these are our two null clines. Let me just write on this one being dx1 dt is equal to zero. And this one here is dx2 dt being equal to zero. And then now we want to add on our arrows. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, what we need to do is we need to think about what is going on um, to x2. So what's going on to dx2 dt when dx1 dt is equal to zero. Okay, so when we're sat on this null line, what is happening to x2? And that will be able to tell us whether we're moving up or down. Okay, so if we think about being on our line x2 is equal to zero, so that's this horizontal line in blue here, we have dx1 dt is equal to zero by definition because it's the null line. And dx2 dt, well, we just need to substitute x2 equals zero into our equation for x2. So if we do that, we end up with 2x1 minus x2, x2 is equal to zero, so this is just 2x1. So that tells me that this, what we care about is the sign of this um, dx2 dt, and that tells me that it has the same sign as x1. Okay, so if we want to draw on some arrows here, we know that on this blue null line, we're moving vertically. If we want to draw on the direction, well, we know that the direction has the same sign as x1. So when x1 is positive, dx2 dt is going to be positive. So we're going to be moving up. When x1 is negative, dx2 dt is going to be negative. So on that null line, we're moving down. If we repeat the same thing for our um, other null line, dx2 dt is equal to zero. So if we think about the second one, so this is the line x1 is equal to x2 over 2. We know by definition that dx2 dt is equal to zero because it's the null line. And dx1 dt is then going to be equal to zero times by x1 plus x2. So recall that's just me multiplying out this line here. So that's our equation for dx1 dt. But we're restricting ourselves to the line x1 is equal to x2 over 2. So we now substitute in x1 is equal to x2 over 2. So again, in this case, the sign of dx1 dt is equal to the same sign as x1. So that means that on this red null line here, we know that we're moving horizontally. And when x1 is positive, we're going to be moving to the right because uh, this means that dx1 dt is also going to be positive, and when x1 is negative, dx1 dt is going to be negative as well, so we're going to be moving to the left.
So this gives us pretty much all the information we need. One other thing we can do is we consider what goes on on the um, line x, one is equal to zero, so along the vertical axis. So on this line x, uh, one is equal to zero, we can see that dx one dt is just gonna equal x two and dx two dt is equal to minus x2. So that tells me that on that vertical line, we're moving up in this direction like this, because when x2 is negative, um, we're gonna be moving to the left because dx1 dt is gonna be negative, and we're gonna be moving up because we have minus x2, so it's gonna be a positive number for dx2. And then we have the opposite case when x2 um, is positive. So this gives me all the information I need to draw on trajectories wherever I start off now. I know that I'm going to be moving up, for example, here, like this, and then generally in that direction there. Likewise, I know that I'll be moving like this, like this, and like this. So by drawing on our null climbs and then um, our direction field by looking at what's going on on the null climbs and sometimes on the axes as well. This tells me um, no matter where I start in this phase plane, what my initial condition is, where do I end up? Okay, so we see that this is a saddle point because we have an equilibrium here. We move towards it in one direction um, and move away from it in another direction. Okay, so this is a saddle. The next type of um, equilibrium we can have is something called a node, and that basically means that we either move towards the origin or away from the origin in all directions. Okay, so if we consider this example here now, expanding out, where are my null climbs? dx1 dt is going to be equals to zero if we have, let's multiply out the first line, two minus 2x1 two minus x2 equal to zero. In other words, we have x1 is equal to minus a half of x2. And this tells me that we're going to be moving vertically up or down on that null line. dx2 dt is going to be equal to zero if let's multiply the second line, minus x1 minus x2 is equal to zero. In other words, x1 is equal to minus x2. And on this null line, we know that we're going to be moving left or right. That's because dx2 dx dt is equal to zero. So if we draw these two null lines now, let's uh, be consistent before. Before we had uh, our dx1 dt null line in blue, so I'll do the same here. So that's x1 is equal to minus half of x2. So that should look something like this. And our second null line is x1 is equal to minus x2. Should look like this. And then now we want to work out what the direction of our system is when we're on our null climbs. Okay, so if we think about the first null climb, which is x1 is equal to minus x2 over 2, we know that dx1 dt is equal to 0 by definition. So this is the blue null climb. dx2 dt is going to equal, let's go back to it, we have minus x1 minus x2, that's our equation for dx2 dt, so we have minus x1 minus x2. So now we just need to substitute in this into here. So this gives us minus x2 over 2 minus x2, which is equal to minus x2 over 2. So that tells me that the change, when I'm on my blue null climb, the direction we're moving in has got to be up or down because um, our dx1 dt is equal to zero, so there's no horizontal direction. And we're going to be moving in the opposite direction to the sign of our x2, okay? So dx2 dt has the opposite sign to x2. So if I draw on some vertical lines, first of all here on the blue null line, we know that we're moving the opposite direction to the sign of x2. So that means here, because x2 is positive, we're moving down, and here, because it's negative, we're going to be moving up. We just add my axes labels in here, x1 and x2. If we do the, the same thing for the second null line, 
So this is the line x1 is equal to minus x2. dx2 dt is going to equal zero by definition, and dx1 dt is going to equal minus 2x1 minus x2, which is just going to be equal to minus x1 when we substitute this into here. So that means, again, that the sign of our, um, our differential equation here, dx1 dt, is going to be opposite to our variable x1. So when x1 is positive, as we are in this region down here, dx1 dt is going to be negative, so it's going to be moving left. This region up here, when we're on this null line, again, we're going to be moving horizontally. dx1 dt is going to be positive because x1 is negative. So again, we now actually have all the information we need to be able to draw whatever's going on um, in this system. We see that if, say, we follow this trajectory, we'll end up at zero. Likewise here, following trajectory that goes into zero. Same for here, and for here, and for here, and so on. So we see that all of those trajectories tend towards zero, zero. In this case, this is a stable node. We could also have an unstable node where we are always moving away from this point, zero, zero. Okay, the last example is a spiral. And that's a case way where we are moving towards or away from the origin in all directions while circling it. We can also have something called a center, which is where we just circle something perfectly. Perfectly, we're not moving in or moving out, so we're not spiraling in or spiraling out. We just um, completely move around it. We'll talk about those um, a bit later on in the course. But um, I'll focus on spirals now, where we either spiral in or spiral out. Again, we can write down um, a linear system and work out its null lines for this example. So dx1 dt is going to be equal to zero here if x1 minus x2 is going to equal zero. So in other words, x1 is going to be equal to x2. That tells me when we're on that null climb, we're going to be moving up or down. dx2 dt is equal to zero if x1 plus x2 is equal to zero. In other words, x1 is equal to minus x2. And on that null climb, we're going to be moving left or right. So let's draw these on here. Uh, x1 and x2 on here. Our first null line is x1 is equal to x2, and our second is x2 is equal to minus x1. So this first null line here, so our dx1 dt is equal to zero. And the second one here is our dx2 dt equal to zero. Now, now we want to work out what's going on with the directions here. So let's do dx1 dt is equal to zero first. So on the line x1 is equal to x2, dx1 dt is equal to zero. So there's no horizontal direction by definition. We want to know what's going on for dx2 dt to work out what the vertical direction is going to be. So we substitute in x1 is equal to x2 into our equation for dx2 dt. So dx2 dt was equal to x1 plus x2. This is just going to be equal to 2x2 now. So that tells me that on this blue null line here, we know that we're moving vertically. And the change in x2 is going to be having the same sign as whatever x2 is. So up here, x2 is positive. So dx2 dt is going to be moving up. And here it's negative, so it's going to be moving down. We look at our second null line. So here we've got x1 is equal to minus x2. We're going to have dx1 dt is going to be equal to x1 minus x2. And here, if we substitute in x1 is equal to minus x2, we're going to end up with um, 2x1. So that tells me that, again, the change in x1 is going to be in the same direction as the sine of x1. So on this null line here, we're moving 
horizontally. When x1 is positive, we're going to be moving to the right. When x1 is negative, we're going to be moving to the left. So we have all of these directions now. Um, we can also check what goes on on our axes. So for example, on the line x2 is equal to zero, we see that dx1 dt is going to be equal to x1 and dx2 dt is also going to be equal to x1. So that means that the change in our um, population state is going to be having the same um, sign as our x1 variable. So both x1 and x2 will be increasing when, um, when x1 is positive and they're both going to be decreasing when x1 is negative. This is important because it tells me that we're not tending towards the center, we're actually spiraling out. So if I take any initial conditions, say starting here, I'll move out something like this. So this is a spiral outwards. So this would be an unstable spiral. If those arrows had been pointing um, inwards on the axes, then I would have been spiraling in. Okay, uh, that's it for today. Uh, there are a few um, uh, self-study questions at the end of this. Uh, make sure you're familiar with um, phase planes uh, in particular and what we mean by null planes and how we can draw on direction fields. Okay, thanks very much.